welcome back to the synthesis of yoga podcast series we have reached the 17th episode in the last episode we saw that shri arbindo was giving us insight into the spiritual reality behind all this apparent transient world of forms there is a self existent reality of beauty and delight it doesn't depend upon the world of forms and its beauty and delight is self existent and someone who has access that spiritual reality and abide in it it is such a person we can refer to as someone who is realized or someone who is seeking that now because of that nature of its self existent beauty and delight and infinite possibilities there as we already touched upon how difficult it is for the progressive mind to deal with this world the worldly life the material life and its challenges so how much more difficult it how much more difficult it will be for the one who has moved into that depth of reality that height of reality therefore the tendency to withdraw from the life from this transient world and develop philosophies that justifies it even when we have scriptures like bhagavad gita there is a tendency to interpret the gita in terms of world is inhabited by the divine the self exists in all and all things exist in the self and everything is evolving towards the self therefore the action in the world doesn't really matter what you do use that as a means to arrive at the spiritual reality and it's not about the world and that is a limited perspective there is this world of duality and there is something happening there in terms of evolution and here when though is concerned about that not only about arriving at that spiritual reality but this transformation of this transient world or so called transient world the world that is evolving the world of forms so now let's move on to today's episode the 17th we will be starting with the 21st paragraph of the third chapter make sure you have the book with you so that we can travel together line by line diving into the details the nuances of the journey so but if the progress also is one of the chief terms of world existence and a progressive manifestation of the divine the true sense of nature this limitation also is invalid the current limitation of this transient world and its inability to express the divine nature that is behind the divine reality that is behind the apparent world there is a limitation there very clear limitation our material body is bound by old age disease death and the world of forms and the society itself caught in the dualities of liking disliking attraction repulsion right wrong all that there is a very clear limitation if progress also is one of the chief terms of worldly existence this worldly existence this material life there is progress happening there is an evolutionary progression happening from simple to more and more complex if that is the condition if that is one of the chief terms and a progressive manifestation of the divine the true sense of nature 
if nature's purpose is progressive manifestation of the divine, and then this duality bound limitation is not to be considered as an end in itself, it not a valid objection. It can be transformed. So let me read that line again. If progress also is one of the chief terms of world existence and a progressive manifestation of the divine, the true sense of nature, this limitation also is invalid. It is possible for the spiritual life in the world and it is its real mission to change the material life into its own image, the image of the divine. It is possible. This is a promise Sri Aurobindo is making. It's a discovery Sri Aurobindo has made. It is possible for the spiritual life in the world and it is its real, real mission to change the material life into its own image. This very material life will be and must be capable of expressing the divine reality through its very material substance. And that is a possibility and that's a promise Sri Aurobindo is bringing in. Therefore, besides the great solitaries who have sought and attained their self-liberation, we have the great spiritual teachers who have also liberated others and supreme of all the great dynamic souls who feeling themselves stronger in the might of the spirit than all the forces of the material life banded together have thrown themselves upon the world grappled with it in a loving wrestle and striving to compel it, its consent to its own transfiguration. Long line, and Sri Aurobindo is giving here three different types of spiritually realized masters and their work. First type, the great solitaries. Therefore, besides the great solitaries who have sought and attained their self-liberation, this is the first type of people, great solitaries, those who withdraw from life into deep solitude and attain to self-liberation, their own individual liberation. This is one category of people. Then, we have the great spiritual teachers who have also liberated others. That's the second type. One is liberating yourself. Then you don't care for the world. You have done your journey. The second type, they have done the journey and they come back to the world and their purpose is, again, not to transform the world, but help the people who are entangled in the world to help them also to liberate from the world. Famous stories from the past, particularly stories related to Buddha, where it was mentioned on the edge of that complete dissolution, he stands back and say, no, I will not take, take that final step. I will come back to the world and liberate more and more people. And the vast teaching that was about liberating people from this entanglement in the world of misery. So that's the second type, the spiritual, great spiritual teachers who have also liberated others. And supreme of all, the great dynamic souls who feeling themselves stronger in the might of the spirit than all the forces of the material life banded together have thrown themselves upon the world, grappled with it in a loving wrestle 
and strive to compel its consent to its own transfiguration. These are the rare, unique categories of great masters who not only help people to liberate themselves, but also liberation is not just for the individual purpose, but to really embrace the world, struggle with it, and transform it, and compel the transfiguration of the world. Great social transformers, the institution builders, they have really compelled the world to change into a better possibility. And they are the ones who take society from one step to other, progressively moving towards greater and greater perfection, and mind itself progressing towards greater and greater richness. So these are the great masters feeling themselves stronger in the might of the spirit. Their power comes from the might of the spirit. Then all the forces of the material life banded together, all the oppositions of the material life banded together. They really battle with the life, engage with the complexity of the life. They are not denying the life world existence, but say there is an evolution happening here, there is a transformation required here, there is a social transformation required. And they fight for it, manifest it, have thrown themselves upon the world, grappled with it in a loving wrestle, and striven to compel its consent to its own transfiguration. In modern times, we see a master like Sri Aurobindo, this precisely was what he was up to. Though outwardly it looked like he has withdrawn from the outer engagement with society, but with the might of the spirit, there was this wrestling with the world forces, engaging with the world at a spiritual level to transform the world and to compel its consent to its own transfiguration. And the more we study Sri Aurobindo's work, we see the, the battle that he was waging at a spiritual level to transfigure the world. So let me read that line once again. Therefore, besides the great solitaries who have sought and attained their self-liberation, we have the great spiritual teachers who have also liberated others, and supreme of all, the great dynamic souls who feeling themselves stronger in the might of the spirit than all the forces of material life banded together, have thrown themselves upon the world, grappled with it in a loving wrestle, and strive on to compel its consent to its own transfiguration. Ordinarily, the effort is concentrated on a mental and moral change in humanity. But it may extend itself also to the alteration of the forms of our life and its institutions so that they too may be a better mold for the inpouring of the Spirit. So this attempt to transform the society can be attempted at multiple levels. So one is the effort is concentrated on a mental and moral change in humanity. That's one level of possibility. A mental and moral change in humanity. Or it may extend itself also to the alteration of the forms of our life and its institutions. The way the society conducts itself, its institutions are built, the nature of the institution, the very form of the institution, they it's themselves need to undergo transformation. 
whether it is educational institution, economic institution, political institution, institution of the family, these things can all evolve towards a greater possibility. So it's not just a mental and moral change, but a systems shift need to be brought in so that they too may be better mold for the inpouring of the spirit. Let me read that line again. Ordinarily, the effort is concentrated on a mental and moral change in humanity, but it may extend itself also to the alteration of the forms of our life and its institutions, so that they too may be a better mold for the inpouring of the spirit. We can see that in today's world, this acute pressure and the need is felt to fundamentally transform our political institution, our educational institution, our economy. Entire thing has become highly destructive and not serving life and its progress. So there is a growing pressure within humanity to transform this institution and to pour the spirit into it, to inpouring of the spirit through this institution, to transform this institution by the very might and light of the spirit. There is a growing need at present to deal with these challenges. These attempts have been the supreme landmarks in the progressive development of human ideals and the divine preparation of the race. So great landmarks in human history had always been such battles where great souls took birth, battled with life, and made a one-step progress in social revolution. We can see many of the great spiritual masters of India in the last century who rose up in order to transform Indian society, to make them progressive. I come from Kerala where we have Sri Narayana Guru, for example. He was a social reformer. He embraced life and attempted to shift the society, move away from its old superstitions and make its collective mind more and more progressive. We can find large number of such great souls who, regardless of their attainment in spiritual world, instead of staying at that level, turned upon life, embraced life and attempted to transform it. Social institutions, are to be transformed. So these attempts have been supreme landmarks in the progressive development of human ideals and the divine preparation of the race. Every one of them, whatever its outward results, has left earth more capable of heaven and quickened its tardy movements, the evolutionary yoga of nature. Every one of them, whatever its outward results, has left earth more capable of heaven because each master is adding a tiny little step and they keep building up. So has left earth more capable of heaven and quickened its tardy movements, the evolutionary yoga of nature the tardy movements of evolutionary yoga of nature. It's very slow. And these great dynamic souls give a push to the next, to the next, to the next. That's the beauty of progressively building up one master after the other. There was a progression of work. And in the last century, we saw what Sri Ramakrishna came and built up Swami Vivekananda built it up further, Sri took it up further, and many other masters parallelly building up in a highly decentralized way. 
because spirituality in India had never been a centralized organization. It had been an organic growth out of the larger collective life, masters blooming here and there, and taking up this challenge of helping the society to progress, bringing the light of the spirit into life and shifting the social institutions. In India, for the last thousand years and more, the spiritual life and material have existed side by side to the exclusion of the progressive mind. It is in the last 1000 years. So here we have three things. One is the progressive mind, other is the material life, third is the spiritual life. In India, spiritual life and material life existed side by side, but with the exclusion of the progressive mind. There was a decline in the intellectual rigor and vigor of India in the last 1000 years. As a result, we can see the larger decline of India that followed. Let me read the line again. In India, for the last thousand years and more, the spiritual life and the material life existed side by side to the exclusion of the progressive mind. So when we look at the rich heritage of India's scriptures, the ancient knowledge, wonderful books of any field, whether it is Charagas or Shushrutas work in Ayurveda or great mathematicians work or astronomers work or yoga work. These are all quite done, done quite early in India, in like 2000 years before or that 500 or 700 and 800 years that followed after. There had been excellent, amazing, progressive mind building up the vast body of knowledge systematically in detail till roughly around 1000 years ago. Then there was a decline of that vast intellectual creativity in India. The progressive mind withdrew. The last school of progressive development we can see in Kerala School of Mathematics that was happening in Kerala in the field of mathematics, but remained as a small pocket. That was like a last intellectual creation, somewhere around 1500. The point is, there had been this opulent, vibrant intellectual culture in India, which began to decline thousand years ago and India went into a tamasic period. And spiritual life and material life lived side by side with the exclusion of the progressive mind. So in India, for the last thousand years and more, the spiritual life and material life existed side by side to the exclusion of the progressive mind. Spirituality has made terms with itself with matter. Spirituality has made terms for itself with matter by renouncing the attempt at general progress. So this is another compromise made by the spiritual spirituality in general. They made terms for itself with matter by renouncing the attempt at a general progress, by not really taking up the attempt to lift up the society. First of all, the progressive mind itself was excluded and spiritual by itself, there was no bridge in between. And what you do is having philosophies that justifies that neglect of the mass. Like the world is nothing but illusion. If you are experiencing all your poverty and if the society is declined, it is nothing but karma. And you are caught in an illusion and this misery, you can liberate yourself. 
and purpose of spiritual life is to liberate yourself from this misery into the freedom of the spirit. So that was the compromise made. Spirituality made terms for itself with matter by renouncing the attempt at the general, at general progress. It has obtained from society the right of free spiritual development for all who assume some distinctive symbol, such as the garb of the sannyasin, the recognition of that life as man's goal and those who live it as worthy of an absolute reverence, and the casting of society itself into such a religious mold that its most customary acts should be accompanied by a formal reminder of the spiritual symbolism of life and its ultimate destination. This is what has happened in India. When spirituality and material life lived side by side, Spirituality obtained from society the right of free spiritual development for all who assume some distinctive symbol, such as the garb of the sannyasin. So that was the agreement. If you are in the garb of the sannyasin, you have the freedom to develop spiritually. And at the same time, the recognition of that life as man's goal, ultimate purpose of life as eventually to become the sannyasin. So we have the Purusharthas defined in India, dharma, artha, kama, moksha. And for stages of life, brahmacharya, karhasthya, vanaprastha, sannyasa, that became the purpose of life. The recognition of that life as man's goal and those who live it as worthy of an absolute reverence. So those who take up this renunciation into this life of sannyasin, having given that absolute reverence to them. So this is the understanding to which India arrived. There is material life, there is spiritual life and those who want spiritual life, you step out of the material life, wear the robe of the sannyasin. And that is the purpose of life, ultimate purpose. Sannyasa is the ultimate purpose of life. And this is been given absolute reverence in the society. Not only that, the casting of society itself into such a religious mold that its most customary acts should be accompanied by a formal reminder of the spiritual symbolism of life and its ultimate destination. So the various institutions related ceremonies, stages of life, whether it is from birth, marriage, death, everywhere spiritual symbolism was brought in. There is spiritual symbolism across India in across ceremonies and it is recognized eventually these are all part of a larger spiritual journey where eventually you come to this renunciation that's a high goal highly honored respected with the highest reverence so the society was prepared symbolically, ritualistically, by casting everything in that mold. So the casting of society itself into such a religious mold that its most customary acts should be accompanied by a formal reminder of the spiritual symbolism of life and its ultimate destination. So in that, the entire temple culture in India played a huge role. If you look at temples. In the very ancient India, there were no temples. Vedic India, there were no temples. Upanishadic India, there were no temples. Temples began somewhere around the Gupta period. And 
That's when the spirituality entered the masses. And it was reaching into the masses. And Puranas, Mahabharata, Ramayana, this became the means for spiritual education for the masses. And going to the temple, worship in the temples, and linking everything to the deity, whether it is family deity, village deity, or the larger deities of that society. That was the means by which this was imprinted into the society, the spiritual purpose of life. The symbolic nature of life. And ultimate reverence, absolute reverence for that which renounces everything and seek that absolute liberation. So let me read this line once again. It has obtained from society the right of free spiritual development for all who assume some distinctive symbol, such as the garb of the sannyasin, the recognition of that life as man's goal, and those who live it as worthy of an absolute reverence, and the casting of society itself into such a religious mold that its most customary acts should be accompanied by a formal reminder of the spiritual symbolism of life and its ultimate destination. On the other hand, there was conceded to society the right of inertia and immobile self-conservation. On the other hand, there was conceded to society the right of inertia and immobile conservation. This is also the reason why Indian society became very conservative. Remember, the progressive mind had disappeared. What was left was only the spiritually realized or spiritual seeking on one side and the bodily life, the material life on the other side as a two separate compartments. And this bodily life was given the right to continue with its inertia and immobile self-conservation. Remember that very characteristic of bodily life is self-repetition, self-reproduction, and self-conservation. So, it was given that space. There was conceded to society the right of inertia and immobile self-conservation. It's sad, but that's what actually happened. The concession destroyed much of the value of the terms. So what are the terms? Here are the terms. Let me read the previous line where he's referring to the terms. Casting of the society itself into a religious mode that its most customary act should be accompanied by a formal reminder of the spiritual symbolism of life and its ultimate destination. So even if these symbolism was imprinted into the society, the very concession to stay in its inertia and conservative mold, so that destroyed much of the value of the terms. Religious mold being fixed, the formal reminder tended to become a routine and to lose its living sense. So when the religious mold gets fixed, we can see everywhere in India, the pandits and purohits doing their chanting, their mantras and pujas, and everywhere there is symbolic representation of the spiritual across India, across societies. But done mechanically, routinely, 
without really knowing its sense, its purpose, or its dynamic power of transformation. It is a ritual, and that's how it become, the rituals become meaningless. Rather, even if there is meaning, powerless. It's not transformative. A true ritual, when you do it with conscious intention, conscious understanding, it has an immense transformative power. But when it is done as a routine, it loses its purpose. So, the religious mold being fixed, the formal reminder tended to become a routine and to lose its living sense. It preserves the forms but loses the significance. The constant attempts to change the mold by new sects and religions ended only in a new routine or a modification of the old. For the saving element of the free and active mind had been exiled. Very, very important point for us to recognize. It's not that India remained in that inertia and self-preserving conservative mold. There had been repeated attempts by various spiritual masters across India, but they were not taking up the power of the progressive mind. There had been largely the attempt of the devotional movement to draw more and more people into the wave, but hardly the intellectual culture, intellectual capacity, intellectual rigor. The progressive mind and its active creative power was not taken up. So we will not find much philosophical growth or scientific growth in India in the last 1,000 years. Predominantly, there had been movement of devotion, bhakti. So the constant attempts to change the mold by new sects and religions ended only in new routines or a modification of the old. For the saving element of the free and active mind had been exiled. So new masters come, they create their new temples, new rituals, and the devotion starts off. And as the master is there, it will grow up. And after passing off the master, the way will subside and it will become another routine, but a new form of the routine. No fundamental shift happening. The constant attempts to change the mold by new sects and religions ended only in a new routine or a modification of the old, for the saving element of the free and active mind had been exiled. You know, Sri Aurobindo had been so ruthless in pointing out the limitations, so blunt and straight. Therefore, it is not so easy to digest him because there is always this tendency to glorify everything that is there in India in the name of spirituality. Yes, tremendous work has been done, but we need to recognize the limitations. And particularly, the rejection of the progressive mind. This is something central to the future. So the constant attempts to change the mold by new sects and religions ended. Let me read it once again. There was a sound in the backdrop. The constant attempts to change the mold by new sects and religions ended only in a new routine or a modification of the old for the saving element of the free and active mind had been exiled. The material life 
handed over to the ignorance, the purposelessness and endless duality. The purposeless and endless duality became a leaden and dolorous yoke from which flight was the only escape. So, eventually, this also justified that ultimate philosophy, that purpose of life was to get out of it because the world is a field of duality, pain and suffering, a yoke that is upon life. It is purposeless and endless duality. The only meaningful thing you can do is get out of it once you are ready for the spiritual renunciation and life of a sannyasin and get out. So the material life handed over to the ignorance. The bodily life was, even though given the imprint or the symbolism of the spiritual significance of life, ultimately in the absence of the progressive mind, it is practically handed over to ignorance to lead it. And purposeless and endless duality from which flight was the only escape. It was a yoke to be in it. So, the schools of Indian yoga lent themselves to the compromise. So, this is the context that was happening in India over the last 1000 years. And the various schools of yoga adopted to that. The schools of Indian yoga lent themselves to the compromise. It was a compromise and they accepted that compromise. Individual perfection or liberation was made the aim seclusion of some kind from the ordinary activities, the condition, the renunciation of life, the culmination. That's what all the yogic schools did in India in the last 1000 years. Individual perfection or liberation was made the aim. What was the aim of yoga? Individual liberation, individual perfection. And what is the condition? Seclusion of some kind from the ordinary activities. Ordinary activities? Yes, there are all the regular institutions of life. Family, marriage, work, money, social institutions of politics, economics, all that. Ordinary activities, you need to seclude yourself and this is the condition. So. Ashrams flourished, where you renounce and go to some ashram, and ashrams live in that spotless seclusion, away from the mainstream struggles of life. And what is the culmination? Renunciation of life, the culmination. So the aim, the condition, the culmination. Three things. Individual perfection of or liberation, was made the aim, seclusion of some kind from the ordinary activities, the condition, the renunciation of life, the culmination. And we can see the continuity of it even now in India and spreading across the world, where those who turn towards spirituality find themselves increasingly being drawn to this idea of becoming of going into deeper and deeper retreats, longer and longer retreats away from life, renouncing life, rejecting life, and finding it increasingly difficult to engage with life in its complexity. And you need secluded life, the peace of an ashram. The battleground of life is not the place where you can spiritually grow. You need some forest, some retreat center, some ashram. And ultimately, what is the purpose? Individual liberation, 
So read this line. It's hard hitting, but very important for us to grasp deeply so that we don't continue with the mistakes, limitations that happened in the past. Individual perfection or liberation was made the aim. Seclusion of some kind from the ordinary activities, the condition. The renunciation of life, the culmination. The teacher gave his knowledge only to a small circle of disciples. In today's world, we see mass movements. This was not the case in India 150 years ago. Spiritual masters gave their teaching to small groups, selected small circle of disciples. The teacher gave his knowledge only to a small circle of disciples. Or if a wider movement was attempted, it was still the release of the individual soul that remained the aim. Even when there was an attempt to reach out to a wider audience, wider society, aim was again set as the individual liberation. The release of the individual soul remained the aim. And we can hear echo of it across India and now across the world what is the purpose of spiritual life? Ending of the cycle of rebirth, the wheel of karma. You need to get out. Liberation is the ultimate aim. And this has now become a worldwide notion as Indian spirituality is spreading. So it's critically important we recognize the errors that has happened, the limitations to be acknowledged and course corrected. If a wider movement was attempted, it was still the release of the individual soul that remained the aim. The pact with an immobile society was for the most part observed. So spiritual movements had this unwritten pact with the immobile society, the bodily life, the material life, which is bound by its conservative inertia. Leave it at that. Either you help a small group of disciples to liberate themselves, or even when you attempt a small, wider reach out to the society, again, the aim is to liberate and not really to transform the society. There was a pact, unwritten pact, unspoken pact. This was respected, observed throughout. The utility of the compromise in the then actual state of the world cannot be doubted. Here, Sri Aurobindo is bringing in another dimension to it. When this was unfolding, there was a state of the world in which it was unfolding and there was a utility to it. The utility of the compromise, this compromise made by the spiritual movements, spiritual teachers and their teachings, it had its utility. So the utility of the compromise in the then actual state of the world cannot be doubted. So what was that utility? It secured in India a society which lent itself to the preservation and the worship of spirituality. A country apart in which, as in a fortress, the highest spiritual ideal could remain itself in its most absolute purity, unoverpowered by the siege of the forces that forces around it. This is the biggest utility provided by this pact. Remember, in the last 1000 India, uh, last 1000 years, India was invaded First, the Turkic invasion, eventually the Mughal Empire, then the British invasion. And these forces that arrived in India 
had nothing much to do with this spiritual ideal of India. And this is where the utility lie. So it secured in India, these masters who preserved the knowledge in small circle of disciples. It secured in India a society which lent itself to the preservation and the worship of spirituality. So on the one hand, the conservative society preserved its bend, the spiritual bend, the spiritual ideal. It preserved it because the very nature of a conservative society is to preserve its beliefs, its rituals, its ceremonies, its customs. So it secured in India a society which lent itself to the preservation and the worship of spirituality. A country apart in which, as in a fortress, the highest spiritual ideal could maintain itself. So India became like a fortress. The society, this conservative society, became like a fortress. And it is also often referred to as the Kurma Marg, that is like a tortoise, it withdrew all its leg, went inside in a shell where it conserved the purity of the spiritual knowledge in small yogic schools. Even when they had limited their aim to be liberation, individual liberation and individual perfection, but the greatest service they have done to humanity is the preservation of the spiritual ideal. Otherwise, it would have been wiped away by the Islamic invasion or the European colonization. This would have been entirely lost. But like in a fortress, this was preserved. So it secured in India a society which lent itself to the preservation and the worship of spirituality, a country apart in which, as in a fortress, the highest spiritual ideal could maintain itself in its most absolute purity, unoverpowered by the siege of the forces around it. So in spite of the invasion from the world around, the forces around, because in the rest of the world, the spiritual ideal was never so deeply imprinted in the society. It remained in isolated pockets and in isolated individuals who realized. But society having this as an ideal, whether it is through the framework of Purushartha, Dharmartha, Kama Moksha, or Brahmacharya, Garhastya, Vanaprastha, Sanyasa, these were the Keywords that provided the framework for the society. And through the stories of Mahabharata, Ramayana, Puranas, there was a preservation through the culture of temples and cultural activities. There was an immense preservation that happened through the rituals and ceremonies. And true knowledge in isolated pockets of yogic schools conserved and preserved themselves. So that is a great service India has done for its herself and for the world. However, but it was a compromise, not an absolute victory. So Sri Aurobindo is acknowledging both the healthy side and limitations. It was a compromise, but it had a place in that social context where India was getting invaded and Indian ideals were getting destroyed. Remember, the Nalanda was burned down. We can consider that itself as the symbolic gesture of that ending of the progressive mind in India. Destruction that was happening in India. So there was spirituality on one side and conservative society on the other side progressive mind disappearing and spirituality having a compromise, a pact with the society, where society took the imprint of the spiritual ideal and applied it across its 
rituals and ceremonies preserved conserved the knowledge and spirituality conserved preserved its deep yogic knowledge in small circles of yogic schools and these two together protected the knowledge for the future of mankind but it was a compromise not an absolute victory and that's what we need to now focus on the material life lost the divine impulse to growth the spiritual preserved by isolation its height and purity but sacrificed its full power and serviceableness to the world this is what happened that's why it's not a victory material life lost the divine impulse to growth there is a impulse to grow impulse to progress and that impulse in its very source is divine impulse and we lost touch with that it is that impulse that helps an individual or a society to progress to evolve so material life lost the divine impulse to growth on the other side the spiritual preserved by isolation its height and purity so on one side material life losing its impulse to progress other side spiritual isolating itself but preserved its height and purity preserved by isolation its height and purity but sacrificed its full power and the serviceableness to life to the world it couldn't really get the full power of its spiritual realization and serviceableness to the world it could get height and purity but not the full power nor serviceableness to the world therefore in the province therefore in the divine providence the country of the yogins and sanyasins has been forced into a strict and imperative contact with the very element it had rejected the element of the progressive mind so that it might recover what was now wanting to it this perspective is absolutely unique and we must dwell on it and understand here he is referring to the european colonization that happened to india it is in europe the progressive mind and scientific revolution emerged and the progressive mind is precisely the element india rejected in the last 1000 years and there was only the material life and spiritual life living in isolation in separation with a pact so the progressive mind had to come from outside and shake india out of its slumber and that's precisely what happened during colonization of india and it was a divine providence therefore sri aurobindo is saying therefore in the divine providence the country of the yogins and sanyasins india is a country of yogins and sanyasins has been forced into a strict and imperative contact the contact with the european civilization through colonization was imperative it was strict it was almost destructive it destroyed the fossilized outer forms it shook india out of thomas has been forced into a strict and imperative contact with the very element it had rejected the element of the progressive mind so that it might recover what was now wanting to it so for the fullness of spiritual growth and transformation of the society 
progressive mind is required. Sri Aurobindo touched upon it in previous paragraphs of this chapter. These three must come together, remove their discords and work together. The bodily life, the progressive mind and spiritual life. They must come together, work together. And India had rejected the progressive mind or India lost the progressive mind. Probably rejected is too harsh a word. It may not be the truth. Considering the fact that the invasions of India destroyed the universities of India, destroyed the libraries of India, that was where the bridges were broken between these different compartments of life, bodily life, progressive mind, and spiritual life. So the progressive mind got destroyed with the destruction of Indian universities. So India had declined over the last 1,000 years. And then this progressive mind coming from Europe, and that too, very interesting, it is, there was this whole knowledge from Islamic world going to Europe, particularly the mathematical knowledge, the knowledge of the zero and the numbers one to 10, all that went from the Islamic world to Europe. And from there, European emergence of science. And from there, the science coming back to India. So the movement of Shakti from India, it moves to Arabian, region and from there going to Europe and from there again now coming to India, shaking India and waking India up. Therefore, in the divine providence, the country of the yogins and the sannyasins has been forced to a strict and imperative contact with the very element it had rejected, the element of the progressive mind, so that it might recover what was now wanting to it. So now with the emerging spiritual future of the world, we need to be very careful in combining all three, the spiritual life, the progressive mind, and the material life. Progressive mind is represented by the science and technology. Spirituality, spiritual movements represents the spiritual possibility, and the masses living in the material life represents masses that is awaiting to be transformed and the spiritual mind and spirit uh, sp the progressive mind and spiritual life together spiritual knowledge together needs to come together and work with the masses with the pro uh, with the bodily life the material life without rejecting it without denying it without demonizing it without calling it an illusion without looking down upon it taking up all the institutions, whether it is financial institution, political institution, educational institution, marriage, family, any other institution, they all must be made progressive, made transformed, made spiritualized. And that's the work that is ahead. So with that, let's conclude this episode, the 17th episode. And... Uh, Thank you for your time and I would love to receive your feedback, suggestions, appreciations, how it was helpful to you, what is helping in terms of what kind of insights are you getting, what I can do better. Please feel free to share. That will be of great value. See you next Wednesday, 6 a.m. Thank you.